You know the old saying, you never get a second chance to make a first impression? That phrase is incredibly true in our business. In entertainment, your first impression can mean everything. It can mean the difference of booking a job or not booking a job, having an audition or not having an audition. That first impression can get you in the door and make things happen. And for an actor, that first impression is the headshot. First and foremost, casting directors, producers, they're going to see your headshot and they're going to make decisions about whether or not you get seen based on that one image. So it's incredibly important to make that image an investment in your future. And to do that, you want to find the right photographer, someone who's going to work with you to craft the perfect image, the perfect first impression. And I suggest you check out portraitsbypeggy.com. Peggy's been doing photography since the 80s, and she really knows her stuff. And she wants to work with you to craft the perfect captured image, the one that captures the uniqueness of you and helps you book the job. She wants to work with you. She wants to really get into who you are, what sort of jobs you're trying to book, and help you get the perfect image. So check out PortraitsByPeggy.com and book your portfolio session today. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Intellectual Podcast. This is episode number 193. I'm your host, David S. Dawson, and I'd like to just take a moment to give you all my greatest bit of thanks for joining us on the show. Uh, we bring this show to you every week uh, to try and help you guys get a glimpse into the people who are making all of the creative stuff that you are enjoying. <clears throat> and um, I hope you all had a good Memorial Day. I, myself, am just getting over being sick, as you can probably hear in my voice. And uh, yeah, if, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the show... Um, please do so. You can subscribe very easily on iHeartRadio or iTunes or Google Play Music just by hitting the subscribe button next to the Intellectual Podcast. Uh, that'll mean that the show will be updated on your devices uh, as soon as the episodes are uploaded, so you don't have to go checking to see if we've done a new episode or not. They will come straight to you. doesn't cost you anything, doesn't uh, affect you in any kind of negative way. But it helps us out a lot. It uh, raises our visibility on the different platforms that you can access us on and, uh, you know, contributes to helping us grow the show. Um, so if you could do that small little thing and subscribe, we'd greatly appreciate it. Today's episode of The Intellectual Podcast is with the president of San Diego Filmmakers, none other than Larry Poole himself. And uh, I've been really excited to get Larry on the show for a while. Uh, he starred in my film in situ and then th this past weekend he co-starred in my sister's film convolution which you'll be able to see at the san diego 48 hour film project screenings on june 6th at 9 30 uh screening group d and uh it's a really cool mo movie Teresa did a, a fantastic job with it so I, I can't wait for you guys to see it um but we sit down and chat with uh, larry just a little bit ahead of the 48 hour film project weekend and uh, we caught up with him a bit on things that he's been up to uh, projects he's been working on uh, we talk a bit about the community at large and and where things are going and, and you know just he's a really interesting guy and uh, he's got quite a quite an interesting background uh, some of you know that background but I think many of you don't and I think you'll enjoy getting a little insight into this very cool cowboy who's a part of our bourgeoisie film community here in San Diego, Mr. Larry Poole, joined to a small extent by Racine Poole as well, here on the 193rd episode of The Intellectual Podcast. Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The Intellectual Podcast starts now. <laughs> You this can is say episode, whatever you want. What one ninety? Uh, no, let's see. Uh, one ninety was the first one today. One ninety one, one ninety two. So you'll be one ninety three. One ninety three, right? Oh, yeah. Almost on right? the big right. two hundredth episode. Almost. We have to do something special. It's a 
the 200th. Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what we're gonna do. I got to figure out exactly when that's gonna drop so Patrick's I can figure there. out. <laughs> Patch, I wish I so wish. So these are a once weekly podcast. Uh, we're we're gonna be switching up to two a week uh, two this a week, week because we're trying to get as many like fringe festival oh. actors and and playwrights and stuff on as we can leading up to the fringe festival. Gotcha. So we're we're expanding into theater. Wow, that's kind of cool. <laughs> Well, sure. Well, it's long overdue. Right in with the entertainment theme exactly. of your podcast, right? Exactly. Exactly. We talk to creatives of all varieties. So, um, so we are sitting down with someone I've been very eager to get on the podcast. One of the most iconic voices in our community, and one of the damn fine actor, Mister Larry Poole. Wow, and I am so happy to be here, David Dawson. <laughs> We're fan. happy to have you. Very happy to be here with you too, Whitney. Thank you. See, Larry Poole and I have a two name thing going on. <laughs> I never call him anything but Larry Poole. And I, <laughs> I don't think you, I don't David, think you ever David call Dawson. anything but David Dawson. That's, well, I know a lot of Davids. <laughs> I know a couple Larrys, but no one like you, sir. Well, thanks, David. I take that as a big compliment. Well, it's meant to be. Um, and the interesting thing is, is like, I'm such a big fan of yours now, but really I didn't know anything about you until like when we did in situ. Um, like all of a sudden, Larry Poole came into my life and I can't get enough Larry Poole now. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I was very impressed with the way you ran your show, crew for that. Thanks. Four Points Film Festival. Yeah. Extremely impressed, and so much so that I like the way you work so much that I was happy to have you on board with Forgotten Hero. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. I got to be the AD on Forgotten Hero. I got to work on the midway. I know. I saw all your pictures. <laughs> Lots of busyness. So, Larry, I, I, I became aware of you as an actor, as the new uh, runner of San Diego Filmmakers, but as I've gotten to know you, like the depth of who Larry Poole is, is a vast ocean. So uh, let's let's go with the obvious. Like, where did you grow up? And we'll go from there. Well, I grew up back on the East Coast. Yeah. You know, as you can tell from my accent, I'm actually from New York. <laughs> He thinks that's funny, but it's true. I swear. Uh, the way Racine's reacting is. <laughs> it is actually true. That's right. What part of New York? Just outside New York City, up upstate, they would call that. Up, in, the, up the Hudson River. In the sticks around the Hudson River? Yeah, you know, Ichabod Crane territory. <laughs> Sleepy Hollow. All right. As you can tell. Yeah, exactly. Sleepy Hollow. Mm -hmm. Little town called Dobbs Ferry. But I left there pretty young. <laughs> Two weeks old. <laughs> Two weeks old. Yeah, so, see, come on, Racine. Move up to that mic. Something You're like going to fill in the gaps yeah. here. This is what we want to hear this commentary. <laughs> Set the but story no, straight. I, I grew up in the deep south, actually. What in part? A, Florida. In Florida? In Florida. And Florida, pre-Disney, was the deep south. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly was. I think Orlando was a town of under 100,000 people back then. Well, yeah, that's why Disney World got put there. <laughs> they could build it quietly and nobody noticed. Mm -hmm. And it almost changed overnight. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a vastly different place from what it used to be. But now I reside out here on the West Coast, and I'm, I am very happy to be here in San Diego. When did you come to San Diego? I, uh, 17, 18 years ago. Okay, and uh, I don't regret that a bit. I've been just about everywhere in this country, and I don't believe I've ever been happier anywhere. And I believe if I could live anywhere in the world, it'd be right here, and that's why I'm here. Yeah, might as well be right. It's it couldn't beautiful. be any better. What was it like growing up in Florida? Like before, obviously, it was grown up. It was pretty wild, I would imagine. Yeah, hot, humid. <laughs> yeah. Think 
walking outside and feeling like you've been slapped upside the head with a wet mop. Oh, I lived in Georgia. I know exactly what that feels like. <laughs> I'm sure Florida's worse. Did, were you like in Swampland? I, I know Racine just mentioned gators. Like, were there alligators around your house? Well, there are alligators, yes. Yeah, Florida's full of alligators. And did you encounter some of these as you were growing up? It's not that hard to find an alligator in well, Florida. It's not that hard to find an I alligator I know, but in usually Florida. if they stay where they are and you stay where you are, then you're fine. I'm just wondering, did you ever have like one no, no, of those no. intense kids, alligator kids encounters? Kids' children disappear all the time. And, yeah, That's Florida. Puppies. <laughs> and puppies, yeah. Puppies disappear and all the time. Large yeah. dogs. And yeah, we alligators were pretty common occurrence from my childhood growing up, yes. Pretty much anywhere you see water, there's a possibility of one being there. Which is pretty much anywhere in Florida. <laughs> yeah. True enough. Everybody's got waterfront property. Just, just fly over Florida sometime. You'll see. Yeah, it. all those all those moving logs. <laughs> <laughs> another, uh, another, what, 10, 15 years? All that's going to be underwater, like, for good, <laughs> the way things are going. Well, that's what they say. <laughs> um. Of course, we're all going to be driving around in a flying car by the year 2000. <laughs> yeah. I don't have my flying car yet. How, uh, how Were you into horses and stuff in Florida, or did that come later? You know, grew up in, an, in a very rural area with all my friends having horses. And, you know, I guess when you're a small child, you always have it in your mind that you're going to be a firefighter a policeman or a cowboy i guess i wanted to be an astronomer that's what i wanted didn't what? pan out <laughs> you know i had a little bit of that going on too yeah you know, i grew up within under the shadow of the space program so that's right right there in central florida yeah. we all grew up watching rockets take off cape canaveral yeah, yeah. and there's alligators there too with me oh yeah no i, I know <laughs> <laughs> um what was what was it like growing up in the shadow of that in that time? Like, I mean, I because I only know it from news footage and stuff. Was it was it as, as as exciting as people say it was to know the rockets were going up? And absolutely, grew up watching them my whole life. Watched all the Apollos, most of the Gemini's, all the moon shots. Watched the shuttles take off. Uh, I never had the opportunity to see a shuttle take off in person. Um, but I did watch one re-enter the atmosphere, um, while I was in Texas. Uh, oh. the shuttle came in, went straight over central Texas on its way to Florida. It was like three in the morning. Okay. And the, it was like a, just a burning comet that stretched from horizon to horizon. It was amazing. Yeah. You couldn't hear anything, just see the burning and a glowing cloud trail behind it <laughs> that extended as far as you could see. Absolutely incredible. That was 1996, oh. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. It's fascinating. Um, so how far from Cape Canaveral were you? Could you, could you see those things launching just from home or we could watch them from home? Sure. But on all the big launches, we would, growing up, uh, go over there to the Indian River and line up on the banks of the river and where you could see the rockets on the pad, feel the rumble of the ground shaking, and it was just an amazing experience. That's really cool. Um, so 17 years ago, you came here to San Diego. What made you leave Florida to come here? Well, I'd already left Florida. Okay. And I, I left Florida at a very young age. Did a lot of traveling back and forth. And uh, late 1990s, I pulled out of Florida with the Ringling Brothers Circus and met this girl in Chicago who happened to be from San Diego. And here we are all these years later. How'd you end up in the circus? Drove out being a horse wrangler, hauling horses out of Orlando, heading towards New York City. And uh, spent a couple years traveling with them. <laughs> so you wrangled, like, the, the show horses that do all the tricks and things like that at Ringling Brothers? Yeah, hauled them from town to town. And, you know, occasionally would haul the baby elephants. 
and uh, zebras and the animals that would travel by truck. Uh, it was a great lifestyle, wonderful life experience. If I had the opportunity to do it again, I would. Unfortunately, you know. That life is over. Yeah. That life is gone. Ringling Brothers was taken down, and they are no more. Well, their last show, I think, is in uh, a week from now. Is that the one down in Atlanta? No, here in San Diego. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, it's such a shame. I, a couple years I rode with them, and I love animals. I've been an animal person my entire life. Anybody that knows me will tell you that. I never once saw any animal mistreated. And I think it's so unfortunate that a bunch of unsubstantiated allegations took out an organization that had been bringing joy to children's lives for 150 years. Yeah. Now they are no more. What a shame. There was no abuse going on. They were taking, it was proven in court that they were taking videos of elephants being abused in other parts of the world, and they'd say, look at these terrible abusers taking advantage of these wonderful elephants. Well, that wasn't happening at Ringling Brothers. Yeah, it becomes a generalization of an entire industry, even though it's not the case for most of them. Well, and it's caused the fall of most of the industry. Big Apple Circus closed a couple of years ago. Um, the only couple that I can think of that are still open are like Circus Vargas. And then, of course, all the circ shows have taken off. But that's a different style of circus yeah, they're altogether. Very different kind of circuses. But, I mean, even that stuff stretching out into SeaWorld and... You know, the zoos, and they're all they're all taking a hit from that. Uh... Well, I saw it up close and personal for two years. Went every city they went to. Never saw one single person abuse one single animal. And if I had of, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't allow that around me. Right. You know, I, I don't appreciate or allow cruelty without saying things. And uh, stern shame. Yeah. yeah. Definitely true. I guess the culture of circus, is, I mean, it just has to evolve at this point because the old style of circus just doesn't exist anymore, which is sad because I remember going to Ringling Brothers as a kid. It was amazing. I think I still probably have a coloring book from whenever I went. I was second grade maybe. Well, it truly was the greatest show on earth. Maybe it'll come back in some form or fashion. That would be nice to see. That would be. Had fond memories. You know, and I just love the whole entertainment, uh, the whole entertainment world in, in all of its facets. Landed here in San Diego and started getting involved in some movie work. How, how did that how did that evolve? I guess it was the result of a step-by-step -step process. And said, I'm a, it started with me saying, I am going to come to California and be in the movies. <laughs> <laughs> Just I as simple it. as that, huh, Larry? <laughs> it is as simple as that. It starts with those two very powerful words in the English <laughs> language, I am. And as soon as you declare those those two, a one letter and a two letter word. I am. And as soon as you declare that and say that, it almost becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. And I said, I am going to go be in the movies. Then I had to decide, well, how am I going to come and be in the movies? <laughs> and I got to thinking about it and I came upon this wild and crazy plan that I was going to go ahead and get involved, get a string of horses that were going to get me to the movies. And and that's how it happened. So you took something you already knew and utilized that knowledge to find your doorway into the new thing that you wanted to do. Yeah. You had to find your, your niche. You had to find that one thing that you felt you could do that not too many people else could. There's a million people that are saying, I am going to come be in the movies. And they're all clamoring and 
stepping over each other to try and get seen. Right. So you got to figure out what makes you unique and then maximize that potential and go for it. And that, that seemed to somehow work. So now I've seen the horses you have now, you've trained them to do all sorts of things. You can shoot a gun off of them. I've seen you get them to lay down. Had you always trained horses when you were younger and had them in Florida or was that something you started out here was the training aspect? I pretty much started out here. Wow. But the, uh, always being an animal person that started real young, real young. So was that a trial and error? I mean, how do you, uh. Learn to train a horse, I guess, would be the question. I guess you hook up with the right girl that knows how to train a horse. Oh, so you you were the horse trainer. Yeah, I've been doing it since I was 12. Scooch up to the mic. We got to hear you. <laughs> Come on. Okay, well, I've been doing it since I was 12. And you had horses out here in San Diego? Uh-huh. Oh, that's I had, awesome. I've had horses since I was eight. I had a small 10-year window from the time my first son was born till the time he turned 10, which I didn't have a horse. And then I got to thinking, well, this is crazy. I have to have a horse in my life. And so I just done it. And I enjoy training them. I enjoy being with them, their their spirit, their essence, and just love the horse. Both of you, your faces light up when you talk about the animals. <laughs> really? It's really... Yeah. Need to see. There's like an uncontrollable smile that comes across both of your faces when you talk about the horses and just animals in general. It's really cool. How many horses do you guys have now, and what what kinds? Hmm. Well, let's see. I have ten, but two are ponies. Well, one's a miniature horse. One's a pony. Got a donkey, and a couple quarter horses, and Tennessee Walker. And a spotted saddle horse. Oh, nice. Yeah. He's the one that you were up the, at the house and you saw us laying him down. Oh, that was yeah. was a spotted saddle horse. Nice. I had Arabian growing up. Mm-hmm. So. Oh, yeah, two Arabians. A couple of those. I, I love Arabians. They Their personalities are uh, rebellious. And I, I think I'm fond of that <laughs> as a character trait. Just, stop yeah. snickering. <laughs> well, there's something about this symbiotic relationship that humans have with various species of animals and it goes back before the written word you know evidence exists shows that people have been coexisting with dogs and horses for longer than we've been writing things down and I maintain that that's the whole building block of civilization. The dog and the horse. As you think about it, when we were just starting off as hunter-gatherers gathered together in small tribes, and we were out there on our own, we were not the most powerful animal on the face of the planet. There were a lot of large top-line predators that could take us out. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, we're humans. We come in this world naked. We don't even have a good fur coat. Our eyes aren't as good as the dog. Our nose isn't as good. And yet men started teaming up with dogs. And a man and a dog was a pretty powerful combination. Yeah. And now you put a man on a horse with a dog. And that three-way symbiotic relationship trumps every other mammal on the planet. Man, horse, dog. And you know there's lots of symbiotic relationships out there, right? Mm -hmm. Sea an enemy starfish or Mm -hmm. sea an enemy clownfish. How many three-way symbiotic relationships exist in nature? So what you're saying is the key to development is three ways. Yes, three ways is the key to development. The whole human condition depends on that three-way relationship. I've been saying this all along, Whitney. Way way to take Larry's beautiful sentiment totally out of context. (laughs) I'm sorry. He said three-way and my brain just went there. I couldn't help it. (laughs) Took it to another level. 
<laughs> Straight down. <laughs> It's been a while since this podcast has taken a trip down that far. I feel like I've I've kept you on the straight and narrow. I've tried anyway. You tried. So you got out here. You guys started training horses. What was was the first film that you were in? You know, the first film we put horses in was filmed here in San Diego. And it was called A Sierra Nevada Gunfight. Good name. It started out being called The Sorrow, and it was a film set in gold mining territory, the Sierras, in, uh, I guess, 1860s, Uh, and it starred Michael Madsen and John Savage, Mm. a couple great actors who were fantastic to work with. It was all mostly filmed here in San Diego. We filmed for... I think three weeks out in the Cuyamaca Mountains Mm -hmm. on location and uh, was a great experience. Was able to uh, be on set there for close to a month. I guess we filmed in in the Cuyamacas and then out in the Anza Borrego Desert. Had a wonderful time. And uh, that turned into some more work and turned into some more. And seems like every job you do turns into another job. Because it's all networking. Yeah. Like if you're present on your set and you're introducing yourself and meeting new people, it's your net gets wider and wider and wider with each production, right? So, work makes work. Yeah. And I've been told that there's – No such thing as bad work. And I'd have to agree with that. You're going to learn something from every job you do. Or you're going to learn somebody. You're going to meet somebody. Like a mutual friend of ours likes to say, you're just one introduction away from taking this to the next level. That's Shane. Oh. That would be a Shaneism. Yep, that sounds like a Shaneism. (laughs) Shanisms. I like that that too. That's cool. (laughs) But it's the truth. You know, when I met Shane on your film. Wait, that was the first time you'd met Shane? First time I ever got to really work with him and really meet him. Wow. You guys just hit it off right away. I would have thought you'd known each other forever. You know, it's so funny. He he said he wanted to work on a Western. I said, I came and said, I really, really want to work on a Western. And we had just got done with your film. And I get a phone call from a friend up in Hollywood. and He had three weeks of work coming up on a Western. <laughs> and I said, uh, you got everybody you need? I said, no, not yet. I said, well, can I bring a friend of mine up? So I can take the carpool in? (laughs) And he said, yeah. Yeah, is he a good guy? He said, yeah, he's a great guy. Can he look like he belongs in a Western? I said, absolutely he can. Yeah. He said, bring him up. And we ended up working for three weeks on a Western with Bruce Dern and Trace Adkins and Luke Hemsworth. It's coming out in theaters on the 7th of July. What's that called? Hickok. Nice. Have to go check that out. You've been in a lot of westerns, haven't you? Been in a few. That's I'm not sure exactly how many, but you know, over a dozen. I just feel like every time I, I look on your social media, it's like shots from western, shots from western, <laughs> something from a western. Larry's a cowboy, <laughs> but recently you you changed your look a little bit for the short that you and David did. Yeah, you freaked a lot of people out getting rid of your mustache. <laughs> Myself included, but was able to play a Navy captain in the yeah. story of a guy that's up for the Medal of Honor. So. How, I know that that's sort of being released. How much can you talk about that project? Can you share a little of the details of the story? Or? You know, it's a great story. And yeah, of course, we can share some details on it. It's a story of a man who in the Korean War got jumped by seven MiG fighters And he shot down four of them, yet had to keep that all secret for 
over 50 years. Because they were Russian MiGs? Because the pilots of the Russian, of the planes were Russian veterans from World War II, and they weren't officially there. <laughs> so that incident never officially happened. But now it's been declassified. The man that was involved with that is a San Diego resident, Captain Royce Williams, amazing gentleman who is a very young 92. And this story is about him. And you got to meet him, right? We all did. He's in the film. What what was that like, getting to meet the person of whom s- story is being portrayed by you guys? It's cool. He's like a cool. super nice guy and like still really sharp. and Amazing gentleman, inspiration. He's the kind of guy, you know, you, you hope you, if you ever grow up, you hope to be kind of like him. Yeah. He's uh, one of the most hale and young 92-year-olds you'll ever meet. And just uh, the whole experience was wonderful. That whole generation of amazing people that sacrifice so much. Could you imagine being involved with something, not even telling your wife for 50 years, keeping that secret? He didn't get any recognition for what he did. Was all classified. They even pushed his airplane over the side. Was riddled with holes and two hundred sixty-three bullet holes. So, no, these were some amazing guys. We're blessed to live in an area that's so full of so many of them. Yeah, and the stories that they've all got uh, was a real honor to be involved in bringing this story to to the screen. And we are hopeful that we can turn this into an opportunity to continue telling these stories because there's a lot of them to be told. There's a we'll never run out of stories to tell. And we have this need to tell stories. That's what we do. We're storytellers. Right? And, well, I, I'd imagine for the people whose stories are being told that it's cathartic because, like you said, they kept this for so long. And then, one, to have artists who are interested in telling that story and an audience who's wanting to listen to that story, you know, to finally have that recognition of what they did or just be able to share it, not even for the recognition, but just so it's not in you. It's yeah. out share it. to be the truth of it, you know? A year ago, we uh, told the story of another San Diego resident who was an illegal immigrant back in World War II. He ended up becoming a double ace, a colonel in the United States Air Force. Uh, Is this the Flying Greek? The Flying Greek. And when we did that, when our our promise was we were going to walk an old man down a red carpet so he could see that his story was told. And we... Filmed that film, and on June the 5th, he got to see the trailer for it. And at night, on 6th of June, he passed in his sleep. Wow. So we were never able to complete our promise to him to walk him down a red carpet. This time, with Captain Williams, I think we're going to be able to make it happen. He's only 92, and he's in pretty darn good health. We feel like we've got a great film that should be able to get into some of the local film festivals. And if we can get this film in one of the film festivals, we will walk him down the red carpet. All of us. (laughs) You as well. Well, even without the film festivals, I'm sure there's some of the local theaters would definitely be willing to do uh, a screening, a premiere. I think think you could do a... Cast and crew screening and do a red carpet and stuff just to make sure it happens. Yeah. We're going to make sure it happens. Our goal for that film and with Flying Greek was to do a film, put it into the GI Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And the Flying Greek was accepted. Excellent. uh, We were able to 
walk Steve Pisanos's widow down a red carpet at film festival. And this time we we're getting things together, should be ready to submit before the deadline and we we hope to get a couple of local film festivals here and walk Captain Williams down a red carpet together. You dropped the uh, the trailer for it the other day. Dropped the trailer for it the other day. It's yeah. out there on Looks the nice. Forgotten Hero on Facebook. Uh, We've submitted to... Oh, that's for this. No, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> so many things to keep track of. Well, there's a lot of things to keep track of. It's Forgotten yeah. Hero. So, so you one. got me the gig as Still first good. AD on Forgotten Hero. All right. Um, just the whole Shaneism. Of, so Shane was a guest on my podcast mm-hmm. and I realized I wanted to work with Shane. So I worked on getting Shane a year later onto our 48. That took a little bit of convincing, but we got him onto our 48. He enjoyed that process enough. We ended up at San Diego filmmakers where he was presenting some of his work, including discontinuance. And he has asked me to stand up with him and talk about the film And that was really the first time I met you, Larry. Yes. Um, And I remember hearing your voice and seeing you at the the San Diego Filmmakers meeting going, that guy is the most unique individual in our entire community. Um, That's awesome. I have to keep my eye out on him. And then we went to go cast and get ready for our Four Points film. And Shane goes... Hey, you know, Larry Poole's got a lot of land and like he he's he's interested in being part of the team if if you know you're open to it. And I went, ah, I, I'm open to it. <laughs> but we'll see what story we're gonna tell. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then uh, when we decided on the story we were gonna tell, I I knew instantly. I said to Shane, I was like, Tell Larry Poole that we're gonna come out and use his property and I got a role for him. Nice. And I wrote the role for you that I wrote. And, uh, you know, you're based around my dad in that film, uh, interestingly mm-hmm. enough. And, uh, man, you nailed the performance. <laughs> I'm so, so happy. grateful you gave me a chance to do something besides being a cowboy. Not that that's a bad <laughs> thing. And I love being a cowboy in, uh, in the movies. But hey, you were an archaeologist. I got you're to be scientist. an archaeologist. <laughs> We start the whole movie with you sounding smart. (laughs) (laughs) Not that you don't sound smart normal. (laughs) No, that took took a lot of movie magic to make me sound so smart. But but wow, I'm so thrilled to be on a podcast called The Intellectual Podcast. Yeah, it's with an X, though. That that really sounds smart. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But no, seriously, um, there there are moments as a director that I, I look for. Um, my favorite thing as a director is working with actors and and crafting performance and finding character and really conveying emotion. And it's only a rarefied set of times have I sat behind the lens and found myself weeping. And you performing those lines with Kayla um, – outside of that RV um, in the nighttime scene um, was one of those moments for me. I just got super teary-eyed. Hi, Mike Peterson. Hi. Mike Peterson's <laughs> trying to squeeze out of here like he didn't walk in. Very here. famous Mike Peterson. Come, don't say in. hi How to the Mike. You? Mike. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Mike's occasionally a co-host on the show, too. Um, and Mike is on the crew next Saturday. Yep, yep. Mike's DPing. He was yeah. DPing. DP. When he was Again. he was behind the other lens when you were performing. We were both looking at each other, going, "Wow, Larry Poole's nailing this." It was so much. It was a, just a. It was a joy as a director, as the writer. Um, it was such a joy to sit and watch you watch you like find that character and just. Nail it. And the thing is, I think Thanks. everybody yeah. sat and watched you perform that scene. Like all the actors who had already shot their stuff were just like, oh, we're just going to peek in, check this out, see what's going on. It was great. Well, you know, it's so nice having a script that was so well written. Oh. It gave us all character roles that we could become. Because for it to be a good film, it's got to have a good story. And that was a good story. 
I'm, so. gl- I'm glad you say that because that's actually also a very nice like tribute to my father because that's the thing that he pressed onto me for years before he died that whatever it is we do whatever it is we're trying to do with film we always have to start with a good story because he was a writer he was a nuclear engineer by trade but he was always a writer he was a journalism major when he first went to college and he really wanted to write like the next great american novel and then he started learning how to do uh plays in the 90s and whatnot and i got him to move into screenwriting when i became a filmmaker wow and, that's a cool uh, story we actually took a screenwriting class together um, which was an amazing experience as an adult to go take a college course with my dad, you know. Um, you know, the way yeah. we met, uh, we did meet through Shane Allen. Mm-hmm. And we met because uh, we were both involved in films that made it into a best of film festival competition. And I went to that screening and I watched your film. And I was so impressed by that film that I felt compelled to go up and find these guys and say, hey, you should come in and talk about your film at our filmmakers meeting. It'd make a great uh, filmmaker spotlight. Right. And would you be able to come in and show it and then do a Q&A? And he said he'd be honored. And that's how we met. Larry, how did you get involved in filmmakers since you brought that up? Started uh, attending meetings. You know, this business is really about 99% about just showing up. I just started showing up. And I liked it, and I thought this was interesting, and what a wonderful uh, platform to get involved in helping to educate and, and at the same time educating yourself. For any of our audience members who don't know what Filmmakers is, can you boil down some of the things that that you guys do? Well, San Diego Filmmakers is a 501c3 um, public benefit corporation. We've been in existence for 13 years. Our mission statement's pretty simple. It's we're here to provide educational opportunities for filmmakers. That's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. That's what we're here to do. And so we, uh, once a month, have a meeting and try and have a topic that's of interest to our local filmmaking community. So uh, next month we've got Billy DeMota. Casting Society of America member. He's been the casting director on 117 movies. Boy, to get an audition in front of Billy DeMota is a unique opportunity Mm -hmm. for anybody in film business. He's a busy man, too. (laughs) To be able to go in and meet him and hear his insights on casting, that should be educational, whether you're an actor, producer, director. And uh, to get the opportunity to spend a couple of hours with them instead of going up and auditioning for three minutes, what a wonderful opportunity. And I think that's education. Our uh, previous meeting was just the other night, and we did it on the 48-hour film project, so we decided we'd make the topic been there, won that. And we brought in some of the award-winning directors. I called you, but you were out of town. I, I haven't won as a director in that competition yet. <laughs> so I you believe you've won stuff. awards. Uh, yeah, yeah. You put out some good I don't think he meant you won the 48, just we, we won, won awards. We won some writing awards a couple times. Exactly. You've seen it. That, that counts. You've been there. You won that. Nominated and, for stuff. Yeah, we've been down there. You consistently get into the, you know, you, you have a formula that works. And what was so cool is we've got, well, Susan Davis and Stephen Mickelson and Tom Antle and Robin and Dwayne mm-hmm. came up, did a panel, and were able to share their secrets, their 
tips of the trade. And they freely gave out their knowledge of what works and what doesn't. That's pretty cool. We all do it for the reason of, hey, if we can make more award-winning filmmakers, that's a win-win for all of us, for yeah. the entire filmmaking community. We're, we're building our infrastructure, and we're doing it by just freely giving it out there. We've got uh, other speakers lined up that are world-famous comedy writers. Steve Kaplan, guy works for HBO, DreamWorks, Paramount. He lectures on writing comedy in Munich, Tel Aviv, New York, Yale University. He's coming here, San Diego filmmakers, to share his knowledge on what it takes to write successful comedy. That's a great educational opportunity. Yeah. For the cost of a five dollar raffle ticket. Come on, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, there you, yeah. Go. you guys also have like an online component to all this stuff too, right? Like you put the you put the speeches and stuff online, mm -hmm. people can watch them there. Yeah. And we did they all go up the whole lecture. Our our previous speakers include people like the president of the American Society of Cinematography, the American Cinema Editors Guild president, uh, Oscar-winning lighting guys, mm -hmm. Emmy Award-winning uh, directors of photography, and all of these seminars, speeches are all archived on our San Diego filmmakers.org. Well, it's almost like a free film class on your laptop. Yeah, sounds like. And, and uh, you know, we, we think there's no downside to that. We've got these wonderful industry professionals and local industry professionals coming in and sharing their insights into the business. And it's out there for all to see yeah. on SanDiegoFilmmakers.org. Yeah, it's a very cool organization. We're, we're keeping her going and uh, got a lot of cool stuff in the works. How far back does the archive go? That's a great question, David. Because uh, I was just remembering, I did, I was, I was on a panel at Filmmakers in like 2008, talking about 48, like way back then be really curious to go back and see what I said. That would be cool to see if it's in there. And, and uh, wow. yeah, you know, so I think it was me. It was me, Mike Brugemeyer, who had, who had won the year before with just a man. Um, who won again last year with. Yeah. Um, and then uh, who else, who else was up there at the time? I think, oh, I can't remember who I was on that panel. There was like eight or nine of us who had done the 48 for a couple nice. of years and had some success of one variety or another sitting up there talking about how we approached the the weekend. <laughs> yeah. You know, that was really, really curious to see. How much has just the um, community had grown since 08 for doing a 48? Like how many teams? Like now there's there were, over 200 teams. That could yeah. Be. Well, there's not, not 200, 200, but whatever. Just over 100 last year. Um I want to say the first year I did it in 07, there were like 33 teams. So and we, and we thought, wow, that's a lot of that's a lot of teams. Yeah. <laughs> and like, now we're one of the largest communities in the world, film communities wise. We're here in San Diego, and a San Diego team just went and won the whole, you know, the whole brass ring and went to cons. Yeah. Oh, really? The four points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the amalgamated grommets won four points, and they're good. Malcolm Eddie Grammons are good. And what was their film that won? Uh, the yeah, Answer. The Answer. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. No, I, I remember seeing that one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they've gone to con like three times, twice with the 48 and once with the... And the, the 48 hour film project's actually what started our organization 13 years ago. It grew out of a 
bunch of filmmakers that were meeting once a month, and they ended up doing a 48-hour film project and decided they liked each other. <laughs> and they just kind of <laughs> keep meeting. Keep Let's doing keep it. meeting. And right. uh, became a 501c3 and been meeting and getting together once a month ever since. On Tuesday nights, which apparently are notoriously difficult for me to, <laughs> to attend. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, maybe we should re-examine Tuesday night because David Dawson has a hard time getting here. And for the last five months in a row, every Tuesday night, we have this major multi-vehicle accident on a local freeway. That's right. That shuts down the entire town every second Tuesday for the last five months. There's been this... Massive pileups. Massive pileups with semis on fire, <laughs> blocking the freeway for hours. <laughs> we, we still hustle, we still somehow soldier on and, and get a meeting done, but it's been difficult the last few Tuesdays. Well, you guys have moved over to American Comedy Palace, right? Com- to the Comedy, the Comedy Palace, Palace. Yeah. on um, Claremont Mesa Boulevard. Yeah, just a which is a very cool venue. It is. Yeah, it's way more fun when the projectors when we were work. sitting at the other place. Well, hey, but you know what? When the projector's not working, we can have something to eat. Have something to drink. <laughs> you couldn't do that at the other place. You were just sitting there twiddling your thumbs, going, "Okay." Yeah, at least they have a great full bar and oh, uh, really nice Greek stuff. food. It does make for a very different uh, meeting atmosphere. It that's does. For, that's for sure. It's a lot more really? light. We don't get kicked out at 9 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. We can stay as long that's as we nice. want and chit-chat. Real conducive network. for networking. Yeah. You know, if we can get 100 like-minded filmmakers in there and all have a good time. <laughs> uh, it's pretty easy to have a good time when you get 100 filmmakers together. Yeah. It is and pretty easy. And, and really add cocktails, time. yeah. <laughs> yeah, add cocktails and some <laughs> good The ladies food. are like, yes, and add the liquor. Cocktails, some finger food, and you're all good. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so, uh, Larry, I have a couple of couple questions for you. Okay. What's next in the works is my first question. So, and then I'll get to my second question in a second. <laughs> well, next in the works, we're helping a local filmmaker friend do his film project uh, next week. And then uh, I guess I'm going to see all you guys a week from today. Yeah. 48 time. And I believe that following Sunday, I'm off to Los Angeles to go work on another project. Oh, my. Back to back. Three weeks. So we we got quite a bit of filmmaking coming up. That's a good thing. Make hay while the sun shines. That's it. <laughs> we had an Get audition a week or so ago for some, you know, another part that's... I feel pretty confident I've got it. I haven't signed anything, but three days after we auditioned, the, they sent me the script. It's a good sign. So <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I've got something to do on that. I've been told verbally that we'll be up in L.A. working on a project that's going to last for three or four weeks. So next couple of months sound quite busy for you. Yeah, and... Uh, there's an awful lot of activity coming here to San Diego as well. Yeah, it, seem, it seems so. I, I've noticed uh, a few more things hitting the, the sites and things, the submission sites. So that's good. That's what we want. That's why we're raising the bar as far as our quality of work and with things like filmmakers. So hopefully it will continue to propagate that way. The work's coming, and there's a lot of things in the works that I think are going to help facilitate increased production here in San Diego. Uh, film business was invented in San Diego. It started right here with the silent films. In La Mesa, right? I believe it was in La Mesa. I, I had a friend who has nothing to do with the industry tell me that recently, that one of the first silent films was in La Mesa, and they wanted to make this area the Hollywood of this area. I mean, it was before Hollywood existed. So, yes. But um, I can't remember why he said that didn't come to come to fruition. Uh, mm. But maybe for the best, because I kind of like how laid back San Diego <laughs> is. I don't think it would Me be too. if it had the L.A. personality. I do, too. And I think we're 
so close to L.A. Uh, that it's, you know, it's only a couple-hour drive. Yeah. You realize most of the country lives places where it takes two hours to get to the store. Well, yeah, I think, most that, country, I think that two hours, geographically. Though, that two hours is a double-edged sword. Because, like, on, yeah, it's easy to come down here and shoot, but I think a lot of the production companies also feel like, yeah, it's easy to just bring our crew down from L.A., so we got to find a way to like encourage them to keep hiring us locally on their productions too. Yeah, good point. And it's I good, think that know. might be in the works with some of the things that I'm hearing being talked about about some incentives to come down here and film that should address a lot of that. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have to put our money where our mouths are and build a infrastructure That's if we say easy. come down here. I don't have to have a very big mouth for the amount of money I've got to put where. <laughs> yeah, see, it's going to be simple. And I, easy. I happen to know for a fact <laughs> that the talent exists here, both oh, yeah. cast and crew. Yeah, I know for a fact. Oh, yeah. I see it all the time. Like quality, too. There's some really quality people here that I think are going to be able to take advantage of a whole brand new way of making films. Yeah. The industry's changing so much since... I said, I am going to go be in the film business. All of a sudden, it switched from film to digital. Yeah. Game changer. Well, that's why I became a filmmaker is because I saw the digital revolution coming. I was like, oh, I can afford the digital filmmaking. I couldn't afford the film filmmaking. So I was able to finally make that transition, admit to myself what I really wanted to be. Which was, I am a director. There you go. You well, are a director. Bring it back and around. And a damn good one. Yeah. Thanks. Um, but yeah, the digital is what finally allowed me to feel like this was something that I could like, actually attain and, and have within reach. Well, and 4G on the phones and the platforms. Technology, technology, cameras becoming cheaper, yeah. which, you know, it also, you know, it's great because it allows anyone to be a filmmaker. But, but obviously there's, there's a more competition. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there's that. Well, you just have to up your game, you exactly. know, better quality, which is exactly. what we've been talking about most of this podcast was upping the quality of San Diego's filmmaking community, which and, sounds like it's being accomplished. And and look at the editing, the, the vast uh, leaps in editing capability that can now be done by you in your house. You don't have to have this giant editing suite that they used to have. You don't have to have the film processing laboratories. Yep. It's all game changer. Yep. And there's an awful lot of smart people out here going to be able to figure out how to make great content. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're showing it. I'd like to see us take a little more time on our films now. Like we've been doing the 48 so much. I think there's a kind of a culture of 48 in San Diego. Right now, I'd like to see some, some more of the filmmakers kind of slow the process down a little bit. Spend a little more time on pre-production, a little more time on post, you know, add a day <laughs> oh, that's... to the shoot, you know, that sort of thing. And just, just give everything a little bit more time to breathe so that you can like... Like wine. And that's going to come when those you edges. can get your, nope. you know, yep. when you can Fine get your budgets in time. line. Exactly. I think it would be great if the community got involved and we had a little more funding because if we can bring more film down here from L.A., that's going to help everybody. It's going to help the hotels, the restaurants. Yeah. So if the community could start funding some of these local filmmakers to up that quality, to give us that time, then absolutely. We'll, we'll make them money. They yeah. just have to help us get started. Yeah. It's an investment. Yeah. You know, and a pretty legitimate investment, you know, uh, and the city of San Diego, they've, I believe, taken some of the TOT tax and funded their film office with Brandy Shima Bukur. She's doing a fantastic job yeah, she's really facilitating. Nice. I was so thrilled when I called, talked to Brandy about getting a permit to film on the Midway. And... She said, well, Larry, as far as we're concerned, the Midway's private property, and you don't need a permit to film on the Midway. I thought, how refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And she said, by the way, do you know Ron Lee? And I said, 
no, should I? And she said, oh, yes, you should. He is the only guy in the world that's licensed to fly a drone over the Midway. And I said, well, do tell. (laughs) She gave me his phone number, and I called him up, and we had a drone flying over the Midway for our shot. And And that was really fascinating because I – as the AD on that film, I got to spend a lot of time with him mm-hmm. while we were like Larry Poole and Shane were down shooting in the bowels of the ship. And I got to go up and prep the next shoot, which was the bridge shooting. And I went up top and I was working with um, with him on the drone. And he was showing me how there's like pockets of magnetic interference over the ship. And he was mapping it all out with the GPS and figuring out where he loses control of the, of the drone um really like intricate he he spent like 2 hours yeah. up there figuring yes, out he where he could fly so that he could pocket that drone like right in the 2 foot window mark in front of the window of the bridge where he didn't have interference was he just using a phantom or was he using the, like an actual uh it was the the phantom it was 3 a phantom. Okay. yeah the the one yeah. the one that does the the weird arm elevation thing. Oh, Inspire. The Inspire, that's it, yeah. yeah. Pretty nice high-end drone, and it just brought so much to our shoot. Took it to a new level, being able to have yeah. you know, a that's camera right outside that. the bridge window shooting in. That was good What's stuff. What's the name of that company that Ron Lee does down in Otai? He does the, the airplane drops. Well, he's down there in uh, South Bay. Otai. The skydiving the Skydiving. He owns a skydiving. owns a skydiving company. Seriously. Seriously. Right. He's one. <laughs> I, I think I do that. Jumping out of a perfectly good airplane is like one of the next level things I need to do. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Of course, of course you've done it. Of course I have. commercial flights the way to. they are, you want to pack your carry-on <laughs> as your parachute. <laughs> then you can just exit. <laughs> Team Intellectual Skydiving. I, I feel this coming up in the future. I think there's a YouTube show coming up. Yeah, baby. <laughs> we should all go down to the I Fly, so the indoor skydiving first. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, idea. let's do that one first. We should do that. That would be easier to film. <laughs> yeah, the squirrel suit. Fine, squirrel suit. That's where we just figure out how to film it so that we know how to film it when we jump out of the plane. There you go. All of us carrying a little iPad or a... Uh, GoPros. Go, go GoPros. 4K GoPros. <laughs> Wee. So, Larry, my second question that I left behind a while back okay. was... She doesn't let anything go. She I remembers don't. where she's at all the way through. Looking forward to the future, what is what is one role that you would absolutely love to play? Mm-hmm. A dream role. Wow, I'd like to play a good guy sometime. Do you usually get cast as bad guys? I get a little bit of that. You, know. you were a good guy in my movie. But I was a good guy in your movie, yeah. so I you know that I guess I've scratched that bucket list, haven't I? You were you were you were damn sweet in my movie. Yeah, that was that was pretty nice of you. You know I'd that love to do Larry some sci fi. I think that would be fun. We can help you with that, I'm sure. And uh boy, I'd like to start getting more into the comedy roles and just rounding out my uh Resume a little bit. Think you so could play good. a banker? A banker? Well, you know, I've played a banker once. In a sci fi film? Oh, a banker in a sci fi film? Because I got a role for you if you can. Oh, well, that I could, you know? Yeah, not an old West cowboy banker. <laughs> He's done the, the, <laughs> yeah, I got to play a Mike Wells Smith, Fargo banker. Mike Smith, our 3D guy, who's yes. amazing. If you need 3D work, contact Mike. Yes, he is. Um, Mike contacted me recently and said, hey, I've got a fully modeled alien from the aliens franchise. Oh, cool. Wow. I want to use it. I've also got costumes and stuff, you know, so he wants to do a full fledged alien fan film, which I'm totally down for, <laughs> but we got to like script that out and figure it out. Right. I was telling the Kilnas from the Kilna companies when I was visiting them in Austin, that we were going to do this alien thing. Right. And they said, we've got a great idea for an alien short. <laughs> And you can run with it. So I'm going to run with it. I talked about it with Mike already. He, he said, yeah, we can totally do that. It'll be real quick. We can like fit it in sometime in the next few weeks. Alien versus Creditor. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> there you well, go. We have like space balls, space bucks. <laughs> <laughs> hits the sci-fi, hits the cool. comedy. <laughs> 
So uh, you know, so I, I, I'm I'm writing it out. It's just going to be like Alien a, a quick scene. Predator. Quick scene, you know, like but, uh, <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll, you'll probably, probably have to shave and cut my hair, but yes, no, we no, can no, do that. no, you don't necessarily need to do that, but we'll, you know, we're gonna have to do like special effects makeup and the whole bit, like, it'll be, it'll be fun. Oh, be that would be a blast. <laughs> so, there, we've answered that question. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All of speak your dream, it will be done. <laughs> I am an alien banker. <laughs> Uh, I think it's timely, you know? Everybody hates the banks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> See an alien get pissed off at a banker. It's going to be great. <laughs> wow, I've just decided now I know what I want to do. I want to be an alien banker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's oh, fantastic. Is there, um, on, on a personal level, is there a, a website for you, Larry Pool? That, like people, is there LarryPool.com? Is there anything where people can is. check your stuff there's, out? There's, uh, you know, IMDb, Larry Pool. There's, Larry there's Pool only on two YouTube. Larry Pools. I'm the one with the picture. <laughs> <laughs> I found a picture for the other Larry Pool, and I got confused with him. And at one point in time, our Profiles were kind of merged, and people would look and say, "Wow, I didn't know you played for the Houston Oilers." <laughs> <laughs> and I saw a picture of you when you were like 1975. You had a big afro. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so that's the other Larry. I just, I just need. We just need to cast him. And like costume with him with an afro because I just need to see that. And right. bell bottoms. <laughs> Did that paint a picture? Bell for you? bottoms. Oh my God, like bell be... bottoms and afro and a Houston Oilers jersey. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah it's a shirt. He has a running back. Three seasons. <laughs> Ruffles and an ascot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, We're gonna have some fun this summer, Larry Poole. <laughs> I'm imagining all this happening to the song "Staying Alive." I don't know why, but that's what popped in my head. Just God, can shot. I wear a Disco Sucks t-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> I'll put up with the disco music if you let me wear that t-shirt <laughs> with sparkles. <laughs> with sparkles. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Well, Larry, I'm looking forward to working with you next weekend. Um, hopefully we get sci-fi for that, too. <laughs> I'm leaning towards sci-fi for that, too. But if you if you're in Western, charge. you're really in love. <laughs> yeah. You're Western musical. Ass. If you draw a Western musical. I want to do a Western musical. You're actually going to mm-hmm. kick ass if you draw that. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> So, cool. Racine, so you talked. We heard you. We heard me. She, getting her to sit over by that mic. Mike. What? Comma what? Mike. Comma Mike. <laughs> yes. Comma dot, dot, dot. You're like pulling teeth, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, thanks for coming down the hill and you know, chatting with us. Great to have you on the show. Thank you, guys. Such yeah, an honor. Fun. Thanks for thanks for joining up with the intellectuals, you know, uh, as producers and talent and Everything else that you guys do, it's just been, it's been a really good time since I met you. So I had so and much that's fun. life should be. It should yeah. be fun. Life is meant to be fun. That is our motto. You hang out with fun, fun people. We ain't doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had enough tragedy in my life. I don't need to find new <laughs> tragedy. <on>. Yeah. <laughs> Let's keep it fun, keep it real. Thank you, intellectuals. Yeah. It's a great time being here. This is a great interview. We need to have you back, though, because there's so much. We didn't even get to talk about the bees. The bees. The bees. So when you have to come back for the when okay. your bee documentary comes out. We'll come back and we'll talk about bees. All okay. right. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> It'll be fun. <laughs> oh, good one. <laughs> Hello there, citizens. I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the floaty that will not flush no matter how many times you try in the toilet bowl of crime. I am Darkwing Duck, telling you please, talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching Intellectual Podcast with your ears. <laughs> <laughs>